What is going on everyone? My name is Andy. Welcome back to another FPL video. In this one, it's the Game Week 37 preview. So I'm going to talk about captaincy and also why you might want to go differential depending on how far you are behind in terms of overall rank and mini league. Then I'm going to answer a bunch of your questions as well. So if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like, hit that subscribe button. Let's get into it. All right, let's start with captaincy for game week 37. Now, it's not the last week that you can differentiate with your captain because obviously you can do that in game week 38 as well, but it is the last time you can do it in a double game week. And if you've got a big gap to close in terms of overall rank and mini league, this might be the week to go against the obvious captain, which will be Erling Harden. So part of this discussion is going to be how far behind you are in terms of FPL points, right? Now, Haaland is by far going to be the most captain player this week. I'm sure a lot of people that have their triple captain chip left are going to use it on him, and that makes a lot of sense. Out of all the players we're going to talk about, he's got the highest goal threat, he's on penalties, his minutes are going to be great in this double as well. We might see him come off early against Fulham, like the 70th minute or something like that, but only if the game is comfortably won, and then he's definitely going to start against Spurs as well. As long as his fitness is fine, I just don't see why he doesn't get uh, two starts and obviously it was a good reminder against Wolves about exactly what he can do so if you're just looking to stay where you are you just want to pick the best player then I think it's pretty clearly Haaland this week in terms of who I would differentiate with because of how many points you are behind it's not an exact science where I can say if you're exactly 17 points behind go for this player but roughly I would say something like this right I've got Haaland as the best captain and then Isaac, Son, and Palmer, the next three, I think they're all really close. That's the order I've got them in, Isaac, Son, and Palmer, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But honestly, you could put those three plays in any other order, and I think it would be more than fine. I would not argue against it. And then I've got De Bruyne and Foden in fifth and sixth place. Now, I would, I would say something roughly like this. If you're only 10 to 15 points behind, I'm not sure you need to back against Haaland this week. I think you you see if you can make up some of those points with other players outside of captaincy and then see how far you are behind in game week 38 and then decide how different to go because 10 to 15 points can be closed in two game weeks. And obviously we saw what happened last week, right? People might have wanted to go different against Haaland and now they're probably even further behind because of the damage he did. So 10 to 15 points, I'd probably still go with Haaland. Any more than that, you could still go with them if you wanted to, but I think you're maybe starting to look at going slightly different. Like if you're 20 to 30 points behind, I think you start looking at Isaac, Son, and Palmer. Now, all those players have fairly high ownership, so they're not massive differentials, but in terms of captaincy, they definitely will be. So I would look at those three players. The reason that I've put um, Isaac in second place is because there's rumors going around that Wilson could be out. Without, I think it's a hamstring injury or something like that. That's not been confirmed. Don't make any decisions based on that right now. But wait and see what Eddie Howe says on Friday. If he is out, that means he's out will be back on penalties. And the two fixtures that Newcastle have are great, right? Brian at home, decent fixture. And then Man United away, right? We're all very down on the Man United defense at the moment. Uh, and rightly so. They're bottom five for expected goals conceded. That, that is a good double game week, and Isaac's going to get great minutes. Like The only game he's not played 90 in over the last eight is the game against Burnley, and they were comfortably ahead in that match, so it was more than you know reasonable to take him off early in the 76th minute. The only thing that's always on my mind is midfielders versus forwards because you get the extra point for a goal, extra point for a clean sheet. So I think you could definitely argue that Son and Palmer are better. I really like Son in this double game week, and I actually think the fact that he's not done well recently kind of makes me like him even more because it's two home games they will get chances against city and bernie is a great fixture and we know what son is capable of even if he hasn't shown it recently he's also their penalty taker as well he's basically their main goal threat unless obviously i don't know richardson's probably up there as well if he gets the minutes but you can't guarantee that whereas you can with son so i think he's going to be underrated a little bit this week man i don't know i i think I, th I think Isaac could be second, but I'm pretty sure if I didn't go with Harlan captaincy, I'd probably go with Son next. So maybe I should have swapped those two around. And then I've got Palmer. You can never argue against him. It's two away games, but they're not too bad in Forest and Brighton away. And obviously, you know how capable he is based on what he's done. And also, he's not even... Obviously, the, there's a bit of an element of luck with the amount of penalties he's had. But his underlying numbers are just very good. Like 0.35 non-penalty expected goals per 90. That's more than Son. Now, Son's a great finisher, right? So you'd still expect him to score more goals. But Palmer has put up really incredible numbers. 
for his first kind of full proper season getting decent minutes. And it's 0.26 expected goals per 90. So any of those three players, if you're more than about 15, 20 points behind, I would start looking at them maybe over Haaland. And if you're even further behind, like 50 plus, first of all, it's probably over already. Then I'd maybe look to go kind of even more differential with like a De Bruyne or a Foden or even a Richarlison if you think he might start twice, someone like that. But that's what I would look at at captaincy. So Haaland is by far the best option. Then it's Isaac, Son and Palmer. I, I'd probably put Son ahead of Isaac and then it's quite close between him and Palmer, I would say. But those three, if you're like a little bit further behind. But, you know, it, I, I think just one, I guess, slight tangent piece of advice is be sure if you're going to go different that you are happy for it to go wrong because I see so many people go different and then they get so frustrated when it doesn't work out and that can happen. Just look at what Harlan did last week with the four goals. Anyone that went with Palmer, it wasn't an absolute disaster, but you did fall further behind than you would have done if you'd just gone for Harlan in the first place. So just be prepared. Like If you're 50 plus and you're just worried about a mini league, it's probably already over anyway, so you might as well just go for it. But if you're someone that worries about what that overall rank is and the you know the history of that on your game week, um, or sorry, on your FPL page, then maybe just play it safe. Harden is definitely the best captain. But I think Isaac, Son, and Palmer are all very strong as well. Let's get into some of your questions. So lots of people are taking minus eights to bench boost. Doesn't that negate the entire value of the chip? And I've already had lots of questions along similar lines. I think this is being massively overcomplicated. Like in an ideal world, you would never take hits in FPL and everything would go really smoothly. But as we know, that doesn't happen. And lots of people have got injured players going into game week 37 in a week where they want to bench boost. So it makes perfect sense to take hits for them if they think those hits will be paid back. Essentially, whether you're playing the bench boost or not, you're always evaluating a hit in the same way. Will I get those points back? If the answer is yes, or it's likely to be yes, then it's probably worth doing. If not, don't take the hit, right? And if you've got an injured defender like Harry Maguire, and you think you're going to take a minus four to bring another defender in, and there's absolutely no chance that hit will be repaid, then you could just leave Maguire in your team and bench boost with three players instead. But personally, I would just take the risk on it. Like the absolute worst case scenario, I think, is a player starts, they don't make it to 60 minutes in the first game, they get sent off and they're suspended for the second game. So they finish on minus points and you've taken a minus four to bring them in. But that's absolute worst case. Realistic worst case is they get one to two points. You've taken a minus four, so you're down kind of two to three. And I think that's a risk worth taking because if they get any kind of return, you're suddenly up on those points. So I think the fact that people are bench boosting is almost like causing just a lot of overthinking about whether the hits are worth it. Like You can't take that bench boost into next season. So you're either using it in game week 37 or you're using it in game week 38. And if you've got injured players that are out for the rest of the season, they're not going to be back in game week 38. And the hit's probably going to be worth even less because you can't bring in double game week players for the final game week of the season. So yeah, of course, like someone that's taken a minus eight to bench boost is in a worse position than someone that doesn't have to take a hit. But as always, you're only evaluating your own team. And if you've got injured players and you've been unlucky, you're probably going to have to take more hits than someone that hasn't. Like, I've been super lucky since Wildcard 35 with injuries. My only two issues have been Edison, who played anyway in game week 36, although that was actually bad for me. And now Fernandez is a doubt. But he could even be back, right? So I'm in a great position, luckily, where I don't have to take any hits necessarily this week. Someone might be sat there with Van Heck, Cher, and Maguire. And they've got to take a minus four or a minus eight to fix it. That is just FPL. We all get screwed over at certain points in the season. But if you need to take the hits to make a better bench boost, then go for it. I mean, you can obviously save it until 38 if you want. But only if you think you're going to get more points that week than this week. Like People keep asking me, which is the best week to bench boost? The week where you're going to get the most points, right? And if you think, I don't know, let's just come up with some random numbers. That your bench boost in 38 is going to score 10 points. And in 37, if you take a minus eight, it's going to score 20 points. Well, then you're on 12 overall, which is better than in game week 38. So I would just take the hits. In terms of what the maximum is, which is another question people keep asking, there is no maximum. How many injured players do you have? I would take hits to get up to 15 players in pretty much all scenarios, right? Some of you might be locked out of double game week players, and then it might be like 
you know, do I take out this injured player for a single game week with a terrible fixture? Maybe not in that specific scenario, but for most people, that isn't the case. You're just going to bring in double game week defenders, right? So Kukurea, Poro, uh, maybe even Arsenal defenders. And then obviously those Arsenal defenders are beneficial for you in game week 38 as well. Even Lewis Dunk at Brighton, I would take a hit for if the defender you've got on your bench is is literally not going to play. I would take the risk that he goes and scores a goal or something like that. Like I just I would be in it to win it. So it doesn't it doesn't negate the entire value of the chip. Like, would it have been better to use it in a previous week where, you know, you didn't have to take hits? Yeah, of course, but that's playing with hindsight. All you can do is work out what's best for you in 37 or 38. And for most people, that is going to be taking a few hits this week. So would you take a minus four to switch Hoyland to Jackson and Gusto to say Dunk? Now, yesterday I talked about Gusto and I basically said, if you've got a spare transfer, I would get rid of him. But if it's going to take a minus four, I'd probably hold on to him because I think the most likely scenario is that he starts one and he's on the bench for the other one in game week 37. But a few people followed up and they said, well, what if the hit is to free up a Chelsea slot so that you can go and bring Jackson in, like in this scenario? I think it's quite close. Like, I wouldn't completely write Hoyland off, despite how bad Man United have been recently. But Jackson is playing so well. His underlying numbers continue to be great, as they have been all season. And Chelsea are just in a really good spot right now, the complete opposite of Man United. And so I think in this case, I would probably do it. You're getting a better striker. And also, you're getting rid of a potential issue in Gusto, where the chances are the most he's going to get is one start. And there is maybe a very like 5% chance he doesn't start either. And with Dunk, obviously, you'd be getting a player that's going to start both games. And although the fixtures are not great for Brighton, it is... Let me just double, they got one home game, haven't they? Yeah, they're home to Chelsea in the second game and away to Newcastle in the first one. Like, he is going to start both games. There's potential there for goal threat as well. I think I would do it. In, in most cases, I think I would take a minus four to free up Gusto, the Chelsea slot, to bring in Jackson if you've got a forward that you're not particularly happy with like i know jackson's been great right i've talked about him a lot i'm happy to own him over the last couple of game weeks he's had four fpl returns he's not suddenly a center right i'm sure he can still be frustrating on his day but i do think he's one of the best forward options for 30 so i think he is part of the best three forwards harlan Isaac, and jackson you know are the, are the three you would go for right now if you're wild carding for example it doesn't mean hoyland jao pedro and Callum wilson if he's fit are absolutely terrible but they are the best three. So I think if it was just to take Gusto out for another defender and there was no reason to need a third Chelsea slot, I probably wouldn't do it. But in this scenario where you're getting Jackson as part of the deal, I think I probably would. So should we stick with Inanna and Dallow or is it not worth the risk? Now, it goes without saying, if you don't already own Man United defensive players, you should definitely look elsewhere. But if you already own them, it's a slightly different conversation. I don't think I would take minus fours to get rid of either of these players. I just don't think there's enough upside there to do that. Like, it's not like the Gusto situation where you're trying to free up a Man United slot. Nobody wants triple Man United right now. Like, maybe if you don't own... Like, I would say that Porro this game week is one of the best double game week defenders because he's so attacking. It's two home games. They get to play Burnley, etc. Maybe because Spurs also have Sheffield United away in game week 38 if you wanted to play him that week too maybe Dallow to Poro is worth a minus four but even in that kind of scenario I think it's quite close so I don't think I would take a minus four if it's for a free transfer I'd maybe do it if you're I don't know let's say you've got Edison and Dallow and you want to free up a slot to get Vardio because you've already got triple man city maybe I would do that with two free transfers but I think for the most part, if it's a choice between selling Dallow or, or Inanna or rolling into game week 38, I'd rather have two transfers in game week 38. There's just not enough standout double game week defenders that are worth using the transfer for. Like I look at my own team, right, for example. I've got the only, in, the, the only flagged player at the moment is Bruno Fernandes. Let's for a second assume that he's going to be absolutely fine to play in both games in game week 37. Essentially, I've got two free moves. And I could just use one. So I could get rid of Dallow for someone like Romero and then roll the other transfer into next week. That would probably be okay. But even in that situation, I think I would sell the Arsenal defender first, despite how bad Man United have been, because it is two home games and I'm expecting Arsenal to concede to Man United. I mean, if Bruno Fernandes is out, then 
the attack for United does look pretty terrible. And it wouldn't be a surprise if Arsenal came to Old Trafford and get a clean sheet. But it's still going to be difficult, right, to get that clean sheet at Old Trafford. So I'd still probably rather sell the Arsenal defender and then just keep Dallow for one week and then just not play him in game week 38. And this is not like some Man United bias. I think Man United defense is terrible. I've been saying it for ages. Bottom five expected goals conceded. Really poor. And it doesn't get any better having to play against Arsenal or Newcastle. But it is a player with a double game week. And there aren't many other double game week defenders around that are like massively better. Like even if, I don't know, let's say you didn't want to go for an Arsenal single game week. You wanted to go with someone with a great fixture like Everton and Sheffield United at home. I just couldn't bring myself to sell a double game weeker for a single, even if it is Sheffield United. And, and Everton players may well, sorry, Everton defenders may well outscore Dallow. Pickford may well outscore Anana. I just couldn't bring myself to do it, especially if the alternative is rolling the transfer into game week 30. You just never know what's going to happen. And there's something about double game week players I just can't shift. So I would take the risk and hold them in most cases. If you've got a spare transfer, sure, get rid of one of them if you wanted to. I'd be more willing to get rid of Dallow than Anana. I just think goalkeeper upside is even lower. But if the alternative is two transfers in 30, yeah, I think in most cases I prefer that. So which double game week players would you consider taking a hit for if it involves removing Arsenal players? And I think the answer is very few. Maybe the attackers that I spoke about for captaincy, so Haaland, Son, Isaac, Palmer, Foden and De Bruyne. You can maybe make a case to take out Saka or Havertz for a hit to get any of those players in. But outside of that, I think it gets uh, gets a bit tricky. Maybe if Bruno Fernandes was fully fit, you could consider him. If you thought Richarlison was going to start all three of the remaining games for Spurs, maybe him as well as a differential. But for the most part, it's just those six players that I spoke about for captaincy. So for example, right, if you don't own Haaland right now, and the best way to get him is to sell Saka to a Madueke, you know, a cheap punt that also gives you the money to buy Haaland, that's probably worth it, right? Especially for captaincy. But otherwise, I would just keep Saka. Like, if it's a straight up Saka to gross for a minus four, as much as I love double game week players, I'd probably keep Saka in that scenario. And it's a similar conversation with the defenders. Like, I do think Man United, especially if Bruno Fernandes is fit, have got a great chance of scoring against Arsenal. Arsenal can still go on and win the game, of course, but we're just talking about the clean sheet. But Arsenal defence is so good, there is still a chance they will get a clean sheet. Plus, they're a threat from set pieces as well. And they've got a good fixture in game week 38. And there aren't a huge amount of great double game week defenders to even consider taking a hit for. Like if Trent was about to line up with Luton at home and Sheffield United away, I'd absolutely get rid of an Arsenal defender for a hit. But Trent's got Villa away, right? And not a second fixture. Is Trent against Villa away better than Arsenal? Yes, but it's not worth a minus four. And outside of kind of Porro, maybe Vardio could be another one worth a hit for. I just don't think I would I would do it. Like, I, I just think the... Op- I mean, I thought this weeks ago, and, and I think it looks even worse now in terms of the defenders on offer this week. Like Spurs, Porro, Man City, Vardio, Man United, no one. Brighton, I mean, Dunk's fine, but he's not worth taking a hit for. Newcastle, who's taking a hit for Dan Byrne or, or Liveramento? Probably no one. And then you've got Chelsea. Like, Kukure is fine if you want to pick him. He ain't worth taking a hit for, I would say. So, yeah, very few players. Those main six attackers, I would say. There's probably someone I've forgotten, but that is about it. Otherwise, I just keep hold of them because Arsenal have not only got a good fixture this week, they also have another one in 38, and I'm pretty sure the title will still be open then. So is it worth swapping Madison to Richarlison for a hit? Now, this is one of those questions where I suspect most people watching have already said yes. Don't even think about it. Just get it done. I'm a little bit less sure, but only because I think Madison's got a good chance of starting against Burnley. I know he's been benched the last two games, but I think he's looked okay when he's come on. And he's just not a player that I would expect to keep getting benched for Spurs. So I think he could start against Burnley. And if that's the case, the hit may not repay itself. I mean, it could do because when Richarlison starts, his goal threat is great. He could absolutely outscore Madison. But if they get similar minutes in the double, I don't think it's a guarantee. And if Madison plays well, you would hope that he would also start Sheffield United in game week 38 as well. So I don't think it's a, you know, 100% certain yes, that you should take a hit. But I also think for most people watching, if they keep Madison and he gets benched again, that's going to be hugely frustrating. And they're probably off just uh, probably better off just taking the hit for that, you know, more confidence in the start. Because I, I do think it would be surprising 
if Richarlison doesn't start against Burnley. He may well get benched against City and then play the final game. But if he's fit enough, he will start as many games as he can for Spurs over the last three game weeks. And you probably can't say that about Madison right now. I, I just think if you think Madison starts, I think you don't take the hit, basically. And if you're unsure or you're convinced he gets benched, then yeah, probably take it. So who are the best double game week goalkeepers? You've got six to choose from, and I think you can narrow it down to three straight away. So Vicario, Petrovic, and Edison, they are the only three that I would be looking at. Nobody wants to buy a Man United goalkeeper right now. That makes perfect sense, as I've already discussed. I think with Brighton, it's just too risky, right? I've said before, I think there's a good chance for Bruggen will start both games in 37, but there's always a chance that Deserby will just play Steele instead. And I just couldn't be doing with that headache. I just don't think it's worth it. It's not like the Brighton defence is so good that it's worth that risk. So I would just ignore Brighton goalkeepers completely. And then you've got Newcastle. But I just think buying Dubravka or Pope is just too risky at the moment. Dubravka's obviously been playing while Nick Pope's been out injured. But Pope was in the last squad for Newcastle. And he cannot be too far away from a start. And he's going to want to start. He's going to want to be in the Euro squad uh, with England. So... I don't know, unless Eddie Howe came out on Friday and said Nick Pope's going to start the next game, I just don't think you take a risk buying either of them. Little side note, if you own Dubravka, I'd be listening carefully to what Eddie Howe says on Friday. Any indication Nick Pope's going to play one or both of the games, I think I would sell Dubravka, even for a hit potentially. But it really depends on, on what he said. That's quite a tricky situation to be in because it might be that Dubravka plays one and not the other one, in which case. That's probably not worth taking a hit for. But if you're on a bench boost, I'm not sure I would want to take the risk of not having a goalkeeper. So I would probably get rid of him. But let's see what Eddie Howe says on Friday. I'll, I'll touch on that again in final thoughts. In terms of Vicario, Petrovic, Edison, it, it then probably comes down to who you want to triple up on. And if you think about each of those teams, right, the best triple up for Man City is three of Vardy, De Bruyne, Foden, and Haaland. For Spurs, it's probably Son, Porro, and then one more. It could be Vicario, but you could also look at Richarlison as well. With Chelsea, I think there's less need for a third outfielder than maybe there is for the other two options. So Jackson Palmer, fine. Chelsea defender, I mean, no one probably really cares if they don't have one right now. So Petrovic, from that point of view, is probably the best option if you're looking to triple up on all of these teams. Um, but in terms of for the double itself, I actually think there's a case to be made that Petrovic is the worst of the three. Like, I know Edison can be very frustrating, but Man United defense is, uh, sorry, Man City defense uh, is still solid. So I think Edison is better than Petrovic, considering they've both got two away games. And the Vicario's got two home games, and he gets to play against Burnley. And I think people are overlooking that a little bit too much. Like every time I mention Spurs defense, it's about how terrible they are. And I get it, right? They haven't been great, and they've lost four games in a row, but they were all against pretty good attacks, right? Burnley at home is not the same scenario so i think vicario for 37 specifically is better than petrovic but in terms of which teams and outfield players you might want to triple up on i think it makes more sense to go for petrovic if that makes any sense like if i was looking to triple up on all of these teams i think i'd want petrovic as the goalkeeper and i'd want six outfielders from spurs and man city I think the other thing to consider is obviously game week 38 as well, because you might need to use the goalkeeper then. They've all got pretty good fixtures. Like Edison's got West Ham at home, Petrovic is Bournemouth at home, and Vicario is Sheffield United away. So that doesn't even really matter too much. So if I was buying one of these for the last two game weeks, I think Edison's just frustrated me so much. I'd probably not go for him. It's almost flip a coin territory. I guess because Vicario has to play Man City, even though it's at home, I'll say Petrovic, but it's pretty close. Uh, if you go for any of these three, they're all good options. I would ignore the other three choices. So who is the best third Man City player, De Bruyne or Vardio? Now, in terms of who's going to score the most points in the double, I'm pretty sure it will be De Bruyne. I don't think many people would argue with that. He's still somewhat of a differential as well. So I really like him as a third Man City option. But as always, it comes down to the combinations, right? So it's De Bruyne plus a defender or it's Vardio plus a midfielder. Now, depending on who the other player is you're thinking about bringing in, that would determine which one of the two City players I would go for. So, for example, if it's Vardiol and Richarlison or Porro and De Bruyne, I'd rather go Porro and De Bruyne. If it's De Bruyne and Dallow, 
or Vardy and Fernandez, and Fernandez is fully fit, which he may not be right, but let's just assume he is for a second, then I'd rather go for Vardy because he's better than Dallo, and Fernandez is quite close to De Bruyne, I would say, especially with penalties and his guaranteed minutes. So in that case, I'd rather go for the Man United midfielder and the Man City defender. So that's not me trying to sit on the defence and not give an answer. I think De Bruyne probably is the more interesting one to go for the double, and certainly the one out of the two that will score the most points. At least that's what you'd bet on. But it will come down to who the other player is. And there's not a huge amount of great defenders this week, as I may have mentioned one or a hundred times in this video. And therefore, being able to stick Vardio in there, who's also got a good fixture in 38, and go for one of the many good midfielders there are, that might be the better combination for a lot of people. I guess if you want to go for a differential captain and you really want to think like far outside of the Son Palmer Harlem box, then De Bruyne is obviously another option for that. But if it's not a captaincy, you know, if there's no captaincy as part of the discussion, then I suspect Vardio plus a midfielder would probably work out for most people. If you enjoyed that video, make sure to give it a like and hit that subscribe button. Rate five stars if you listen on podcasts. I'll be back tomorrow for team selection. I'm going through my own team thoughts on what moves I can make. There's actually quite a few options this week, but a lot of it will depend on the fitness of Bruno Fernandes, as you might imagine. Then we'll do final thoughts on Friday and deadline stream on Saturday. So thanks for joining me. I'll catch you again tomorrow.